All right, let's welcome in Desmond Bain. Desmond, huge fan of yours. Uh, I believe this is the first Memphis Grizzlies player we've had on the podcast, and we've oh, talked a ton about your team. So this is this is a real treat for us. So thanks for joining the show, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, did you guys have any idea that you would be this good? You're sitting at 35 and 18, third best record in the NBA, coming off an eight seed. Uh, other than you know Stephen Adams. Uh, coming in a trade for, for, for Valanchunas, there, there wasn't a ton of uh, changeover in the roster. Did you envision that you guys could be this good this fast? It's funny because, um, you know, going into the season, we were having those same kind of debates within ourselves. You know, we didn't really know um, what type of team we were going to be. Obviously, we were young and we had got a little bit of playoff experience. But, um, you know, JV was a big, big load for us last year. And Grayson Allen, um, you know, great shooter, obviously doing well in Milwaukee now. So um, losing those two guys and, you know, we, we drafted well. I think Zaire is a good pickup for us, but he's, you know, he's young. You know, it's it's hard to win games in this league with with guys that are young. And I mean, you look across the board, and we got a bunch of young guys. Yeah. I was um, just gonna say, all you fuckers games. are young. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it's special. I mean, we we got a special group. Um, you know. I think it's our culture, our togetherness, our resiliency. Um, John Morant's obviously blossomed into a superstar. Um, and we got several guys that have, you know, taken a leap this year. And, um, you know, we're having a special season. And, uh, you know, it's a special organization. Is there a part of the, the youth where you're almost like too young to know any better? <laughs> and that, that's that's a great way to put it because we're going into L.A., we're going into Philly, we're going into all these places, and it's just like – shit let's hoop yeah. you know it's just we're not worried about anything all we're worried about is getting better and going out there and trying to put together winning basketball we did a segment a couple episodes ago at the beginning of the show where we talked about your team for an extended period of time and i described your team as fearless yeah and the embodiment of that is a number of players Ja, obviously being probably the the easiest to, to point to Dylan Brooks I would put yourself in that category uh Steven Adams how much of that naive naivety that that Tommy's speaking to uh is driven by Jaws fearlessness in specific yeah I mean I think that you know obviously when your leader and your star player has that um those characteristics that trickles throughout the team and um you know we, we follow suit but um you know we have a lot of guys that are just underdogs um you know I mean job played a mid-major um you know I had one division one high major scholarship played four years at school Dylan Brooks played three years um you know so we got some guys that um you know didn't take the same path that everybody else took kind of unconventional routes and um you know it shows on the court we, um, especially during the bubble run that the Miami Heat had, we were accused um, quite often of being a Heat podcast. And one of the things we talked a ton about was just Heat culture. And, yeah. and it's, it's in, a, in a way, memeified now, and it's hashtag Heat culture and all that bullshit, yeah. and people have to buy into yeah. it. It's, it's cultish. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but the, the, the other team that I think embodies that mindset more than anything is your team. Yeah. And we were just talking offhand just about um, – how your organization operates, how your team operates, where do you think that culture comes from? Who's the driving force behind that? Um, so, you know, I think it starts at the top, um, you know, with our, our management, our coaching staff, but, um, you know, obviously our players have to carry that out. So, I mean, I spoke to it a second ago, but, you know, when your stars are doing all the right things, um, you know, on and off the floor, it's hard for, you know, the rest of the 12, 15 guys to not fall in place. So, you know, give a lot of credit to, um, you know, our staff and our organization, but, you know, it's a player led organization as well. You're, you're in your second year. When I look around the NBA, when any casual fan looks around the NBA, it's fairly common to get caught up in all the drama around the NBA. <laughs> Do you ever think to yourself how lucky you are to have been drafted by the Grizzlies oh, and not have to deal with this so far in your it's, career? It's crazy. I mean, I hear some of the stories that I hear and um, – doesn't even sound real, you know, given, yeah. <laughs> given like the locker room that we have, the guys we have. Um, yeah. So, I mean, to say that I'm 
thankful to be drafted to the Grizzlies is an understatement. So, so we're <laughs> gonna we're gonna get into your background in a second, but I'm curious. We had we had Dame on. I think Dame was actually our first guest. We had Dame on last year, and obviously he has a sort of similar mid major background to mm-hmm. John and some of the other guys in the team, and. He talked about how lucky he was basically to come from that background because when he got to the league and even when he started to have a lot of success in the league, he was able to avoid a lot of the bullshit because he had already sort of gotten through it and he still had kind of a, you know, chip on your shoulder or whatever you want to call it. But he was able to kind of miss a lot of the drama that we're sort of talking about. Do you feel like that, like your guys' collective background, even though it's a little bit different, just by coincidence, you're all from these places where you, like you mentioned, the underdog factor, like you have almost like a shared bond in a way? Most definitely. And I mean, I think that's why we hit it off so quickly. I mean, we're, we're a young group, but, um, you know, we, we won playing games last year on the road at home, um, gave Utah a run for their money. Um, you know, I thought we handled ourselves pretty well throughout that series, but um, I mean, it's just, it goes back to the things that we talked about. I mean, just that, that underdog mentality, always kind of having that chip on your shoulder, um, feeling like you have to prove somebody, um, you know, right or wrong. Playing for the Grizzlies, being on a great team, playing with a player like Ja, who, deservedly so, has gotten a ton of attention this year. Probably not enough attention, admittedly. Do you do you guys internally talk about how, in general, the national media doesn't give you a lot of attention? For sure. I mean, that's that's another chip on our shoulder that we <laughs> carry. I mean, we, the chips just continue to, to stack up, you know, on top of our shoulders. But, um, you know, that's one of them. You know, I feel like we're one of the most exciting teams in the NBA with, um, you know, a great story. I mean, things that the fans and people around the league would easily cling to, but for some odd reason, they don't want to throw us on the TV. I I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about this. I went to your game in LA, the first one, the Mm -hmm. one that you guys lost. Yeah. Um, But it did, it did feel like at that point it was like most of the people there had no idea who anybody was on your team besides Ja. Yeah. Does that feel like it's like changing at all, or is it still like you guys are just coming in anonymously and then just like busting their ass and then leaving? (laughs) So like for sure about the first 30 games like you know we're walking around everybody's ja 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 and obviously rightfully so but um now you know the collective group is you know starting to get a little more love the grizzly is starting to get a little more love and um you know i don't think we're sneaking up on anybody now what, what about for you do you feel like your uh name recognition your stardom your fame whatever you want to call it do you feel like it's different this time last year than it was a year ago most definitely. I mean, I think that it, it is different, but it's still, you know, it's Memphis. You know, I'm playing for, for the Memphis Grizzlies. You know, if I was doing what I was doing here in New York or one of these other markets, people would be talking about me much It would be different, different in New York. Most, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Most definitely. But, um, you know, I've I'm come from a town of 30,000 people, graduated with 20 kids in my high school class. So, you know, I've, I've never been one to, to need the recognition and stuff well, like we, that. We should, we should get into this now because you brought it up. Uh, I, I am actually very curious about your background playing basketball because I know you played a bunch of sports growing up. Yeah. You went to a small school. Yeah. Um, when did you realize that you were actually pretty good at basketball? Did you did you make a choice at some point to give the other sports up? So it was kind of around my freshman. You, I'm going to be honest with you. You look like a football player. <laughs> <laughs> I get that everywhere I go. It's funny, funny story on kind of piggybacking off of that. When I got to TCU, um, you know, it's hot. I'm a kid from Indiana. I'm walking around sleeves off and stuff. And everybody, you, you, you on a football team? I'm like, no. And then they just keep walking past. Because at that time, the basketball team hadn't really earned any respect yet. But, um, you know, I mean, it was around my freshman year that um, I don't want to say that I had that love and passion for basketball yet. It was almost like it, like my hand was forced because I went to such a small school. I played football and baseball as well, but um, my high school didn't have a football team because we didn't have enough boys in the school to field a team. And uh, I had been playing travel baseball my whole life, so I was just kind of burnt out on it. My elbow was starting to get sore. I losing a little bit of love for it. So I was like, well, let me, let me give this travel basketball thing a try. And that was my first summer playing 
playing AAU was my summer going into my freshman year. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm not too bad. I was seeing some of the kids around the state that were, you know, some of the top players in the state. And I was like, why can't I, you know, be one of those guys? So, you know, over time, put the time in, put the work in. You guys know how that goes. And, um, you how, know, How we tall are. were you at that point? I was about six one, six foot. Is it like same build? Or did you uh, so it was funny. I was like my sophomore to junior year. I was probably like six foot two, and then come my junior year, I was like six five, and I probably gained like thirty pounds. And I was drinking this little drink called Spiroutine. It's like a protein shake. So every time somebody asked me, "How'd you how'd you get those muscles?" I'm like, "Drink this." <laughs> And it didn't work for anybody but me. They better make so. you their pitch, man. Yeah, they for real. Watch this episode and call for you. For real, <laughs> for real. I'm, I'm actually very curious how much weights you lift currently <laughs> and how much <laughs> – I said I saw Dave McClure. I played with him at yeah. Duke. I saw him uh, by the elevator when, when I was walking up the stairs. And uh, I was like, man, Desmond, Desmond looks low-key like a bodybuilder. <laughs> 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 and, and I'm what because again, like you're a great shooter. Yeah. You're a great shooter. And there's this stigma around having a certain physique and For being sure. a great shooter. Like you shouldn't lift <laughs> if you want to be a great shooter. I'm just curious. And obviously that's not true. Steph yeah. is yoked. For sure. There was a period of time in my life where I was I would lift on game days and then sure. go hit six threes. So yeah. I'm just curious for you though. How 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 often do you lift? So it would it would be wrong for me to say that I lift like an outrageous amount. You know, I mean, I I would say that I have a, a strong work ethic, but um, you know, I don't lift like just lift myself to death. You know, like I I lift just like anybody else. But so some of it's kind of God given genetics. Natural. Yeah, yeah, that's impressive. That's impressive. So so you were you were you were playing, but then we were talking about this. We 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 found this in the research, but we were talking about it with you before. So you had one, coming out of high school, you had one scholarship offer? One high major offer, yeah. So going into my senior year, I was going to commit to a NAI school, Indiana Wesleyan University, just to get it over with so I don't have to worry about it throughout my season. And I went to a camp, and um, Furman, uh, Ohio University, reached out afterwards. So I was like, I mean, I'm not going to NAI if I got a chance to play Division One. So, um, you know, they came to a couple open gyms and they ended up offering me a scholarship um, right before the season started, wanted me to sign um, right there in that early period, kind of get it all done. But I waited it out, waited it out, and um, played AAU in the summer um, as a senior and then got TCU like two weeks before I graduated high school. And I was like, it's, I'm going. That's amazing. That's a, and so you weren't a top 100 player. No, no, oh no. Not only top 100. I tell me if this is wrong, but I read it in the research. You weren't even on any of the no, like sites I didn't, or anything, like I rivals or anything. Like I that. didn't play on like my top. Like I played on Indiana Elite, and I was on the B team until I was a senior playing with juniors. So yeah, I was in the back gym. <laughs> Nobody knew about me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. You were on the B team the B in the team. AAU in the AAU yeah, circuit. Yeah, you weren't even team. on. The, yeah, I wasn't the even on the best team. team. Yeah, we had to pay to play. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Bill's character. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, you, you, I, I didn't realize this. I don't pay a ton of attention to the draft, but you, you actually entered the draft after your junior year. Yeah. What was the feedback that you got in that period of time? You obviously decided to go back for your yeah. senior year, but what was the feedback you got during that period of time? I don't even think people were really taking me serious, like, t to be honest. I mean, I was like, uh, I got invited to two pre-draft workouts. I went to Boston and I went to San Antonio. Um, I thought I had a good showing of both. Um, but, I mean, they didn't even really speak to me about coming out of the draft or anything like that and then I went to a PBC camp and one Utah Jazz scout told me like you need to go back to school like you need to go back to school and I was like but I shot 40 percent from three and I'm strong and I can guard like I, I got a role in the league blah blah he was like go back to school so I was like I mean there's nothing really here for me. You know, I didn't want to leave early if I wasn't getting a guaranteed contract or anything like that. So I think it was the right choice. Was that was that process disheartening? 
Uh, did you, to did, a degree, did it, did it motivate you more? Defi- or it, did? it definitely did, but it I wasn't. Mean, it wasn't. You didn't. You view it, view it as a setback. Definitely not, because I still at the. I, if I would have came out my junior year, I still think that I would have been able to find a way onto a roster, just because of, um, you know, my character, what I bring to to the table as a you know player. Um, so I mean, it it was it was more motivating, but it didn't like write off my NBA dreams at all. Yeah. Why do you think? What What do you think happened senior year that allowed you to go in the first round um you know I I diversified my game um you know for those first three years of college I was really like a spot up guy run the floor um energy plays and stuff like that my last year I was able to come off of some floppy screens and different type of actions play with the ball in my hands a little bit so um NBA teams felt a little more comfortable that you know I could be more than just a standstill shooter with with short arms that that skill development and skill progression to me has been very rapid in your NBA career. For sure. I remember playing against you last year, in mm-hmm. my last year, and obviously on the scouting report, great shooter, yeah. run them off the line, <laughs> yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. But in watching you this year, the ability to to play out of pick and rolls and hit pull up jumpers. I think you're one of the best in the league at attacking closeouts and getting to your dominant hand. You're, you're so strong going right. Your sidestep threes, you use your shot fake better than most young players that I've seen. When did you start feeling comfortable in the NBA as more than just that spot up guy? It was summer league. I mean, summer league is a time that I can point to that's like, this is like, I can see my career kind of building off of this. Um, you know, obviously the playoffs and everything like that was big for me um, from a confidence standpoint, just knowing that I could be a part of a playoff series and a playoff team. But, um, you know, I didn't even want to play summer league. Um, you know, I was like, I played in the playoffs. I played 70 games. I started 20 games, you know, like, why am I playing in the summer league? But, um, you know, the coaching staff knew what they were doing, made me uncomfortable playing the point guard position in summer league, put me on the ball. And, um, you know, I think that it changed my, my career, honestly. Did you feel like you had a game this year? I mean, just looking even at your, at your game log, like your numbers have been good throughout, but there's mm-hmm. definitely been a, a spike mm-hmm. over the last couple of months. Did you have a game this year where you felt like you kind of figured it out a little bit? I think it was on the road against Utah. Um, you know, I've been solid up to that point, but um, that was kind of like my game where um, I was just doing a little bit of everything, you know, on both ends of the floor, big win on the road against a, a good team who was at full strength. Um, and I think from there on out, I just kind of kind of took off. That's a good point, Tommy, because it did feel like early on, very solid. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, Desmond Bain had 28. (laughs) Oh, Desmond Bain had 32. (laughs) Desmond Bain had 25. It was like a night to night thing. And you had this run. I talked about this. I don't know when it was. I talked about it on ESPN. But, you know, you had like a 10 game stretch or 10 or 11 game stretch when Ja was out Mm -hmm. where you were at 23, 5 and 3 on 47 45 90 splits Mm -hmm. which is just remarkable so the the progression there i i think is is amazing i do want to go back just for a second and talk about draft because we always like to bring the the draft stuff up guys because every every draft story is so unique and it's such an important period you know important moment in a guy's life for sure um so you obviously drafted by the by the Celtics, and then mm-hmm. your rights were traded to to Memphis. But can you just kind of take us through that whole process after your senior year, uh, when you kind of had an idea that you would be a first round pick? Mm-hmm. What was draft like night and all that stuff? Yeah, I mean once once the interviews um, started coming is is kind of when I started picking up some steam. Um, you know, it was obviously a different year. Um, of a pre-draft process just because there were no workouts. Um, The combine was very limited, so teams didn't really get a chance to, you know, get up close and see us, um, you know, in person probably as much as they would like to. So I didn't really know how it was going to go. You know, I saw at the beginning of the process, I was like a mid-second round pick, and then as teams started gaining intel and interviews and stuff, I started going up the boards, and I mean, come draft night, I mean, some people have me as high as right outside the lottery, so, you know, we felt pretty good about it, we felt good about the teams that were in that range, and 
draft night comes i'll never forget it i had my whole family in the living room and stuff and detroit calls right after aaron neesmith goes 14 and we knew detroit had 16 and they were like sit tight we're trying to make it happen so i was like oh like i'm going 16 to detroit we're in there celebrating 16th pick goes by we don't get a call i think it was isaiah stewart that goes off the board and then we had saw the Detroit traded for 19. So we were like, oh, we're going 19, whatever. Obviously didn't take me a 19, they took Sadiq Bay, And then 21 came and we knew Philly needed some shooting, didn't know what route they were gonna take. Obviously they took Maxi, and then after that, the picks just started getting traded all around the place. So I was sitting there, I started getting nervous. Every time somebody, um, like a pick went by, you could just feel like the life in the room getting sucked out. Like, cause everybody thought I was going 16 to the Pistons. Like it's, it's like, okay, like it's okay guys, it's gonna happen at some point. But um, yeah, so I was sitting there sweating, getting anxious. But um, I mean, I've said it time and time again, I'm so thankful that, um, you know, I got drafted to where I did. Do you have the, we talk, to Draymond about this, do you know every pick? Yeah, I know, I know pretty much everybody that was drafted in front of me, yeah. This is what I love about just athletes and highly competitive people is, like, dude, you were a first round pick in the NCAA. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome, man. Yeah, like you it's tell an me. awesome <laughs> moment, like congratulations. Yeah. yeah. But inside, there's that turmoil. For there's sure. that competitive juice for flowing. sure. For sure, for sure. Um. I want to I want to ask you about sort of the uh, the the modern the evolving modern high volume three point shooter because in my career how threes were generated changed for sure you know when you know when I played with Orlando you know we were one of the first teams that played four out one in mm -hmm. spread pick and roll Dwight Howard diving down the lane. <laughs> There was a lot of spot up threes or swing swings. Yeah. There's not a lot of swing swings now. No. You know, teams are trying actively to take away corner threes. For sure. Um, and so, and then it, then it was like Kyle Korver and me, Clay Thompson, Steph yeah. running off screens. Um, then all of a sudden, Steph and Dame and all these guys started shooting <laughs> 10 threes off the dribble and yeah. high pick and rolls a game. Yeah. Um, you're shooting seven a game at 42%. That's high volume, highly efficient. How do you feel? you get most of your shots right now in that in, in i know you shoot more than threes but yeah. in terms of getting those those bullets out like yeah. shooting those bullets like how do you how do you generate that i mean it's it's uh that was that was honestly one of my focuses going into the off season is just being able to get them off in a multitude of ways so um whether it's transition i mean try to find a lot of threes before the defense is set because you know in the half court um teams are going to key on you a little bit more and um, obviously not allow you to get those off, but I mean, playing with a guy that's dynamic like Ja, um, you know, if you don't show him bodies, he's gonna be living in the paint all night. So a lot of times teams will show, you know, a little help and then run out hard at three point line instead of, you know, driving in for the layups or go try to finish over a big, I'll let them fly by and um, shoot those side step three. So I get a lot of those. And then we have, you know, a few ATOs and things like that, that I'll get, but um, <clears throat> try to get a lot of them when the defense aren't set. And then, um, you know, just in the free flow of the game, whatever it may be. Yeah. The, the balls to take transition three, transition dribble up threes. Not many yeah. guys have the, the, the skill set or really the just the freedom to do it yeah and you do that really well um the two-man game with, with with steven adams is really interesting to me too because yeah. you guys have a nice dho game a nice dribble handoff game you also use the throw and go mm -hmm. with him and obviously the pinaways yeah i played with him last year he's one of the best screeners <laughs> yeah he's one of the best screeners in the league for sure he's such a great teammate his job is so thankless to me. I know. It's just he doesn't get enough credit and praise for, for how good he is at what he does. I know. I mean, you look at the box score and he might have four points, eight rebounds, and, you know, one block. But, um, you know, what he does for us is 
um, you know, limitless. You know, he's he's our connector. He keeps offense going. I mean, you know, playing with a, a guy that's a great screener like that is a shooter's dream. You know, know that you're coming off the screen every time and the defender's going to be trailing you to to some degree, um, you know, is, is a nice feeling to have. And with my ability to get in the lane and play a little bit more in there, it's I think it has made us a little more dynamic offensively. Yeah, your ability to, you know, specifically on those pinaways, going to your right mm -hmm. hand curl and either take it to the basket or shoot your floater. Another thing I've noticed is your ability to relocate. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really for any shooter is such an underappreciated skill for sure. Because, you know, if you're running a set play and John Morant's <clears throat> running a pick and roll, you're, you're standing still for sure. You know, you're standing still, you're letting that pick and roll happen organically Jaws obviously surveying the floor. He's reading whatever coverage the the big is in, what, whether they're going over or under. So he's doing that. But the skill for the guy off the ball for sure. is figuring out when that help defense comes and what the passing angle is is where, where the passing angle is for Jaw to get you the ball. And I think you do this better than any young player in the league. And, I, and I'm curious if that's something that you've learned since you got to the pros, or has that always been an intuitive thing for you on the basketball court? So I think it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, I grew up watching sports every day. You know, I was never like a TV show, cartoon um, type kid. So I think just watching the game and seeing what works for certain guys, I think, was was big for me growing up. But, um, you know, I give a lot of credit to uh, Ryan Miller. He was my assistant coach at TCU. Mike Miller, obviously, his brother played in the league forever. Um, you know, and in the back half of his career, I mean, he was a standstill shooter, you know, a guy that couldn't really create shots on his own. So he had to learn how to play off of stars and guys like that. And he, Coach Miller, you know, originally was telling me that if I got an opportunity in the NBA, that's probably what my role would look like. So we spent a lot of time, um, you know, learning the nuances of, of that type of stuff, playing off the ball and how to be effective and efficient off the ball. Did you watch anybody besides Mike Miller? Were there yeah, players yeah. that I you mean, yeah. tried to He had me watching emulate? you. He had me watching. <laughs> yeah. I'll t like that going into my senior year of college, like that's all he showed me was like you flying off of screens and um, some of the stuff that you were doing at Duke and some of the stuff you were doing in the pros. So, but I, I can't do that stuff. Like where he just taking off running, shooting the ball, falling out of bounds, like that. shooting on the turn, like yeah, before I even yeah, turn. like jumping four feet in the air and letting it go. That's that's just not me. Did, but are you guys? This so we were talking about this before. We talk with uh, about JJ's wingspan all the time on the show. The negative probably wingspan. close. Is are you the only two that are like this? No, there's other guys in the league. <laughs> no, but like, but like, there's this is a. But is, I'm just curious about because I think we've actually had a conversation about whether having that wingspan actually has helped you as a shooter. I don't know that it's helped me as a shooter. It's certainly been a detractor. It it was a detractor for me defensively. I can tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's what like so my I'm, I think my wingspan that I got measured at the combine I was six four barefoot and I had a six two and a half or six yeah. two and three quarter wingspan or something like that yeah. and that didn't change during my career that stays, <laughs> yeah, that, that stays forever that stays forever. that's just my body yeah <laughs> do you, you're 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 obviously a little taller than me but do you do you ever feel that that is a negative for you on the court. I mean, there's times, I mean, like, especially when I'm guarding bigger wings, like guarding Tobias Harris and, and guys like that. I mean, we were just guard, playing against him last night, so I'm using him as a reference. You know, you really got to be locked into the game plan, do your work early, because, I mean, if those guys get to a, a spot that they like on the floor, I mean, there's – Pretty much nothing I can do. do. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can stretch my little arms as far as I want to, but, um, you know, he's 6'9 or whatever. So, um, yeah, just things like that. That's about it. I though. think what makes it worse for you is that you're so jacked, too. I know, so for it, real. It, it's like a visual. It makes it look it really like it's really, like yeah, everybody, yeah. Yeah, it's, I've been getting that since school when i first got here Ja was calling me t-rex yeah has there I, get ever, that a lot. Has, I get that a lot has there been another jack shooter like this Ooh, that's a good question really good question i mean i don't i don't know yeah. i don't know of any i don't know they're like, kind of like specialists or like shooter shooters i don't know so you talked about the 
the summer league from this past from this past summer and how that was sort of an eye-opening moment in terms of what you were capable of doing this yeah. level and then that's obviously translated into this season and you're young in your career and I, I this is a great question to ask you 10 years from now and I, and I hope your game has evolved where this question doesn't get asked but do you do you get upset that the other parts of your game and your other skills, all the things we've talked about, don't get appreciated as much because you're such a good shooter? So, or because maybe that's your reputation? For sure. Like, I've, I came into the league and everybody was saying 3 and D. And I mean, I still, you know, hear that quite a bit. Like, he's a, a good shooter, he plays hard on defense. Um, so, I mean, yes and no. I mean, like I said, I'm not really the guy that like wants all type of praise and recognition, but um, you know, I'm gonna continue to to work on those parts of my game until you know it's known that I'm an all around guy and can do multiple things on the offensive end of the floor specifically. Did you have a, a welcome to the league moment? With you? I mean, it was probably last year when we played the the Lakers. Um, it was like our fourth game of the year. I mean, we started out the, the year, I think, played like Orlando, Cleveland. So not to t not to say anything bad about, you know, those teams or anything like that. I mean, obviously, Cleveland's doing some special stuff this year. But, um, you know, I hadn't seen like any true superstars yet. And then I think game four, we play a healthy Lakers team. And it's like, you know, LeBron, AD, all them. And um, I'm picking up LeBron full court. And it's like the end of the into the quarter. So like, I'm trying to be pesky on the ball and he just put a forearm on me and I'm like, oh my God, this dude's strong as shit. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was kind of like my welcome to the league moment. Just like, you know, I mean, I've fulfilled a, a lifelong dream of mine. Um, obviously he's special talent, one of the greatest players to ever do it. And uh, yeah, it was eye opening for me for sure. Was, was LeBron sort of the guy for you growing up that because for I was just thinking about I, so I basically I grew up with LeBron. We played against each other yeah. in high school. We did camps together. Um, I think I met LeBron when we were like when we were 15 years old. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't him for sure. For me, when I got to the league, it was Kobe. Yeah. I couldn't yeah. believe I got to play against Kobe, which was wild. But was for that, you, man? was it LeBron? No. So I mean, I was a uh, I was like when I was older through my high school middle school years is when he was really in the finals every year so that that's kind of where that comes from but when I was a kid I mean I I like Dwayne Wade Kobe of course Reggie Miller was an Indiana kid that used to shoot the ball like crazy so um those were like my three guys that I really really loved as a kid like I had a big Dwayne Wade poster in my in my living room or in my bedroom I, I I'm very curious about Dylan Brooks um We've talked about him. We've mentioned him. I want to know more about him. Guy comes to interesting, dude. guy comes <laughs> to to press conferences wearing fur fur coats. <laughs> this the swag and the just the self confidence is off the charts to me. It is. What what's it like to be around him on a daily basis? I mean, you you hit the the nail on the head with the self-confidence is through the roof i mean you can't really say anything to that dude but the crazy thing is is he's got like the biggest heart out of anybody i know you know really nice guy would give the shirt off his back for somebody um and like basketball is just like the place that he can let out like all of his aggression and anger and i mean he he's not shy um you know with with his play, with what he wears, with what he says. I mean, he's a confident dude. I don't know where that comes from, but, um, you know, ever since I've known him, he's not been he's kind of fearless. Do you agree with the assessment that you guys talk the most shit in the league? Yeah, I think we're up there for sure. I, feel I like mean, three different people have said yeah, that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think that, uh, I mean, we're just young. Like, we don't know any better. You know, I mean, we kind of spoke to it earlier, but um, anything goes with the Grizzlies. <laughs> Is do, would you? I know Jaw's the best player on the team. Yeah, there's something about Dylan. I feel like he's the heart and soul of the team. Is that accurate? I, I would say that that's very much so. I mean, even 
with him being sidelined for the majority of the year, I mean, you felt his presence. And I don't know how much you can say that about other guys on our team. Um, you know, if they were to miss this amount of time, they would still be able to contribute um, just from a leadership standpoint, from a um, attention to detail standpoint, an eagerness to still win standpoint. Um, you know, he's a winner um, through and through. What do, you, what do you think makes Jaron, we were talking about this uh, last episode, what do you think makes Jaron so good defensively? He doesn't care. I mean, I think that, you know, as a big man that, like, protects the rim, you got to be fearless. Um, you know, when anybody's driving in there, um, you know, being willing to be that guy that's rotating and, you know, you may end up on the wrong side of a poster every now and then or pick up a foul or whatever the case may be. I mean, he's he's going for everything. And, um, you know, obviously he's, he has great ability to move for, for a guy that's seven foot and can um, switch out on the different guys and guard the perimeter, guard wings, guard bigs. I mean, he's he's versatile on the defensive end. He's He's special talent for sure. Hey guys, we all spend time shaving our face to look nice, but when you need to take things to the next level, there's a much more important part of our body that needs some attention. Our privates. Our sponsors at Manscaped are here to save your balls this year. So join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code JJ for 20% off and free shipping. Take your package to the next level with their Performance Package 4.0 and brand new ultra premium body wash. Yep, inside the Performance Package 4.0, you'll find the signature Lawn Mower 4.0. This electric trimmer is designed to trim hair on loose skin. The advanced skin safe technology reduces cuts and nicks to keep your balls safe. The package also includes the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver, two unique formulations that take care of the smelliest part of your body. The Manscaped Ultra Premium Trademark Body Wash and their Shed Travel Bag and Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs. I've tried the body wash as well, and it smells great. So kick discomfort and poor hygiene to the curb this year and use the best tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code JJ at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code JJ. It's new year, new pubes in 2022 with Manscaped. Hey y'all, I think it's time we get serious about sleeping. We all need it, right? So why not do it the right way? No matter what kind of topper or blanket you have on your bed, if you're sleeping on a terrible mattress, your sleep will be terrible as well. That's why I recommend sleeping on a purple mattress. Only purple mattresses have the gel flex grid. It's a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. The gel flex grid is amazingly supportive for your back and legs while cushioning your shoulders, neck, and hips, no matter how you sleep. You'll never have that I'm stuck feeling you get with femory foam. Because unlike memory foam, which remembers everything, Purple Mattresses bounce back as you move and shift. Plus, you can try your Purple Mattress risk-free with free shipping and returns. Financing is available too. I have one of these, and sleeping on a Purple Mattress really is a game changer. So remember, getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. Get a Purple Mattress. Go to purple.com slash JJ and use code JJ. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash JJ, code JJ, for 10% off any order of $200 or more. One last time, purple.com slash JJ, promo code JJ, terms apply. It's no secret that cryptocurrency may represent the future of money. It's one of the most exciting investment opportunities to come around for some time. But what about taxes? Well, with an Alto Crypto IRA, you can trade crypto like Bitcoin and avoid or defer the taxes. Trade all you want without the tax headache. You can create an account in just a few minutes with no setup charges and enjoy secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. Yep, Alto has industry-leading security to keep your mind at ease and multiple ways to fund your account, such as making a cash contribution, transferring cash from an existing IRA, or utilizing a rollover from an old 401k. So are you ready to take your investments to the next level? Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches. Open an Alto Crypto IRA with as little as $10. Just go to altoira.com slash three. That's A-L-T-O-I-R-A dot com slash three, three spelled out, T-H-R-E-E. Start investing in cryptocurrency today. Go to altoira.com slash three. Confidence, swagger, fearlessness, that word has come up a bunch. This is probably a stupid question, 
but do you guys see yourselves as championship contenders this season? For sure. You do? For sure. I mean, we're, we're the type of organization that's not really – I mean, we're young, you know, so we're not like those teams that have been building for seven, eight years trying to – to make a run at this thing. But I mean, to say that we couldn't do it this year and the coming years, I think is dumb. You know I mean? Yeah. Given what we've done. I, 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 I agree with you. I agree. And so much of the playoffs is about matchups. Were there, exactly. were there any lessons or takeaways that you had from playing the number one seed, the jazz last year in the playoffs? Um, I mean, they were, they've been there before. I mean, you could tell, I mean, we go into their place and we beat them game one and, um, you know, it's like it didn't shake them, you know, not at all. I mean, getting the game on somebody else's home floor is is key in any playoff series. Um, and we did it early and we did it, you know, we threw a punch. We thought it was like we're here, you know, and, I mean, they bounced back and beat us the next four games. So, um yeah, I mean, I think that experience is is huge, and I mean, we we got it. I mean, obviously, only play one series, but I think that it'll do wonders for us this year and in the coming years. We we, we were we were talking earlier about uh, in regards to the sort of the championship contention about you guys playing up to your competition, and maybe that's not the right word anymore because of where you are. But you know, you've beaten Brooklyn, you've beaten Phoenix, you've beaten Golden State twice, I think. Um, do you feel like, and this might get back to sort of the confidence and then not really giving a fuck, but like, do you feel like you guys get up for those games even more so than you would for sort of a normal game because you have that chip? Most definitely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, given a young team, that's kind of part of like what you go through. I mean, obviously, um, they say play down to the level of competition or rise for the big games. I think that last year specifically, we did that a lot. But this year, I see a different maturity um, about our group just coming out and handling business. I mean, we've had guys in and out of the lineup, obviously, with COVID and injuries and coach goes out, you know, but um you know, we stayed professional all year long, and I think it's a testament to to our guys and and how we've matured. Perk has tried so hard for the last month to create this narrative that I am a Ja Morant hater because <laughs> I won't say that Ja Morant is the MVP, and it drives me fucking crazy. He did it again today. He, I think he calls it the dark side or something. Like if you're yeah. a Grizzlies fan, you're on the, I'm, dude, I'm on the dark side. I love you. <laughs> he actually has said he I've said been saying this is last said spring, since November or December no. that that yeah. is literally your favorite player in the league. I know, I don't know, but but whatever. But the thing I want to ask you about is <clears throat> part of what hurts this narrative about him, and obviously he's had a fantastic season, and mm -hmm. since he came back from his injury. You know, his on-off net rating, all that bullshit, like spectacular, yeah. all his numbers spectacular. You guys are winning. Everything's everything's great. But part of the narrative is this 10-2 run that you guys had mm -hmm. without him. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of hurts his MVP candidacy. Um, do, do you think that, like, the, the I guess I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get to sort of how you guys were able to do that without him. Because if you look at your team, and this is not a knock, that there's Ja mm -hmm. in terms of being a superstar. Mm -hmm. And then there's you and Dylan and, and JJJ. There's no like clear cut second superstar. And mm -hmm. you guys just continue to win. What do you think is is the reason for that? I mean, we, we've talked about, it. I mean, our culture, our confidence, our swagger. I mean, I think those are... Um, you know, the reasons why. I mean, ultimately, I mean, we go into every game, regardless who's suiting up, who's on the sidelines, and we feel like we're going to win. I mean, it doesn't matter who we're playing against, where we're at, how many games we've won, how many games we've lost. You know, it was a big hurt, <clears throat> a big hurt to lose job more emotionally than anything. Um, but, I mean, Tyus Jones is about as rock solid as they come off the bench. I mean, so um, Dylan Brooks was playing well. He was healthy. Um, you know, JJJ was finding his rhythm. Um, so, I mean, to, to put that on Ja and um, knock his MVP candidacy and what he's done, um, you know, throughout this year, I don't think it's fair to, to him just given – 
you know, the type of year that he's had, the run that we've been on since he's been back in the lineup. I mean, we're a good team without job, but we're a great team with him. You know, he's a he's a guy that can take us to the next level. And, you know, we were 10 and two, but we, we have beat some teams that had, had guys out, been through some COVID stuff. Not to say that that run was invalid or anything, but, I, you know, I don't think that we're a championship level team without John Moran. No, I totally agree with you. And in hindsight, because Perk said this legitimately like three games after he came back, the first time he said it. In hindsight, I think the lesson that I learned from that is how great of a team you are. For sure. That it wasn't just about Ja. Ja yeah. wasn't the driving force to your start, not the driving, not not the 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 number one reason for for your team being able to win or make, you know mm-hmm. get the eight seed last year. It was just a it was a complete unit, and that's that's sort of the view I have now. For sure. And I don't think it. I don't think that run hurts or helps his candidacy at all. You know, yeah. for the record, by the way, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> I mean, you could say like whatever, but yeah. like he's he's like top three right now, top three. And so much can change in the NBA week you to know, week. This yeah. season is crazy. I mean, for two months, everybody was like, Steph or Katie is the MVP, exactly. And then Steph goes human, exactly. becomes a human, yeah. stops being an alien yeah. <laughs> for for a month, and 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 Kevin gets hurt, and and then now you look at. And Jokic and Embiid yeah, MB dominating exactly. every night, so yeah. it's it's wild to me, and it's so much of any sort of postseason award um, is 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 centered around the narrative and the story Most behind definitely. it, you know. And and I think, look, I think Jaw's story and the Grizzly story is is tremendous. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to root for. Are there are there any specific plays from the last two years that he's made that you were on the court for and you were just like, what the fuck? How did he do that? I mean, that block that he had this year was was unreal. I mean, I had a front row seat for it. You know, I was right there. It was crazy. Um, like know, so, like, what was going ball. through your head when he blocked? When he, I mean, that. coach used to get on me all the time for fouling in those situations. I just fouled in that situation last night, but <laughs> so I just try not to foul. I mean, hoping a guy miss a layup. I didn't really know Ja was running like that, and I mean, his he's all over the backboard, catching it with two hands and running the other way. I mean, it was it was special play, and then he just had another play two games ago when he caught the windmill dunk. I mean. Last night, I mean, he probably had three or four sports center top ten. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, at this point, it's becoming routine. You yeah. know, we, we, we play Jaws on a highlight reel somewhere. It's funny because we talk about it like we were talking about it with Draymond the other day, but, like, when you have guys like Steph, it's like this in his own way, he's very different basketball-wise. It's a, it's interesting to what, like, the, their teammates are thinking while this is happening because yeah. everyone on the court is an NBA player. For but sure. There's one guy doing shit like that. For sure. It, I mean, it's it's diff, it's – it's not fair to say that it's like normal because it's definitely not, but we see it so much. It's just like, that's just Ja. Like that's who we know Ja as. And then when we go on the road and you hear the oohs and ahs and you see the way that these other players talk about him, you really get an appreciation for how special he really is. Like there's nobody in the league that's, um, you know, doing stuff like him. He's like a mix of like, healthy Derrick Rose and AI like he's one in his own yeah the when we had Andre Iguodala on last year he talked about how when Steph would go on his runs he wouldn't even quite realize what was happening yeah. in the game yeah. because he's locked in on the exactly. defensive plan exactly. he's got to guard the other team's player he's yeah. thinking of the next play yeah it wasn't until after the fact that he would be like, oh, Steph had 25 in the first quarter. Like <laughs> yeah, He wouldn't even exactly. quite realize it. The difference to a degree with Ja is that they, these are singular athletic events yes. that defy block. what should be yeah, possible. The block defies yeah. logic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, he said it when he did the windmill the other day. It was after the, you talking about the one after the whistle, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We did that. He said, yeah, I was, I was thinking about doing between the legs. <laughs> and you're like, like what? What? <laughs> no, nah, I'm just going to windmill instead. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you have um, non teammates? Do you have young guys around the league that you just like to watch? Um, I really like Tyrese Maxey. I mean, I thought that every time we've played against him, he's uh, been real solid. I mean, Tyrese Halliburton, I like him a lot solid um can do a little bit of everything um lamello and edwards obviously special guys but um 
I mean, people were saying coming into it that our 2020 draft class was weak or below average or whatever you want to call it. But, um, you know, I think that we're going to go down as one of the better classes. Um, well, Desmond, we appreciate the time. This has been a lot of fun. I'm rooting for the Grizzlies just man. as an observer. We'll see, you after, as a fan. we'll see you after the playoffs. We'll check in and where we're at. <laughs> All right, we appreciate it, bro. Thank you.